everyone. Thank you so much for joining us tonight here on our Mirbo live stream live at the Twin Cities Film Fest opening night. We are so darn excited that this night is finally here. We are kicking off our 10th annual here on our Ballard Spar sponsored red carpet up here at the Showplace Icon Theater where the entirety of the festival takes place. I'm super duper lucky enough to get to be your host tonight, Doug Sidney. Our opening night programming kicks off with Robert Jury's Working Man. We also get to talk to Peter Garrity and Talia Shire. Thank you, you three, so much for joining us. This film, Robert, I want to start with you. It's, it gets you here and it gets you here. I know this is a cliche question to ask, but where did you come up with the, the, the idea for this? What, what space did that occupy for you that you wanted to tell this story? Um, just having grown up in the Rust Belt, okay. uh, long and short story, yep. uh, growing up a kid in the Midwest, you can kind of identify the issues that are going on in, in the industrial sector. I mean, folks, work is important, yeah. right? I mean, it's a big, yep. big lesson we all learn, and, yep. and uh, I think it's a big lesson in this film. So through a child's eyes, you, you, you lived that. Mm, I did. Yeah, I grew up on a farm in Iowa and grew up close to factory towns along the Mississippi River. So, yeah, pretty near and dear to me. And so was that a really easy, was this something that had been gestating for you for a long time? I have to get this up on screen. I have to tell this story. First draft was written about 10 years ago. Okay. So, yeah, and, and I don't know that it's, uh, if it's the exception or the rule. I think that's true of a lot of films, yeah. indie or big, big movies. I think sometimes it just takes a while to get made and fortunately um, at least for this film I think the story is still pretty relevant with the times we're living in now it is it's such a it's such an eye and a voice to to middle America I think so. Peter your performance is amazing how did you how were you able to come to relate to this character did you have did you have any personal experience of of anyone like this in your life how did you inhabit that space for that character for Allery it seems to me that we all have um, experience of family and and you know not everybody but um, I come from a family that pretty much fell apart at one point and had to be put back together again. And you weren't always sure whether it was going to be able to be put back together again. So you were always, you were, to a certain extent for years, you're walking on the edge of a precipice. You're walking on the, on the brink of, of losing. A, 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 a. So the sense of loss that's in this role and in this piece, this story that Bob wrote, is powerful. And it's powerful to me. And that speaks to me. I am... I'm so glad you brought that up because we talk about this is set in the Rust Belt. It's a it's a working it's a working man's film, but at the heart of it, it's about family and it's about loss. Just like just like you mentioned, Talia, your role you have made a career on bringing subtlety and nuance and so much depth into bringing the the matriarch of a family holding that together. Was this, were you immediately drawn to this project? What, what part of it spoke to you? No, oh yes, I was drawn to the writing of the piece. I was given the script to begin with by our friend Clark Peterson and I thought this is extraordinary. Now, although it is very different what I'm about to say, but Hollywood is a factory town. You know, they made movies and we had musicians and we had costume designers and hairdressers and those days ended too. And I, I think all of us who lived there felt that loss. We didn't know where to go in the morning. That's the key to this piece. What do you get up yeah. to do? And how do you make meaning out of your life? So it, it resonates with everybody. And so I have to ask this. When, when you two read the script, and Robert, when you were writing this, the arc for these three characters, when you read it, did, did, you, did you believe it? Because that arc is so important that happens, and it is so well translated into the final product. That's a difficult task to do for a writer. You wrote and directed the film as well. Did you both feel that initially when you, when you, when you read the script, seeing that, that corner turn and that turning point? Because it's so pivotal on the impact that these characters are having with each other. I just have to say, I have to say, we got luck. I got lucky because this is my leading man and he made this he inhabited that role with extraordinary humanity because it's somebody who's kind of 
shut down and how do you do that with so much soul but we also got lucky with I think Billy Oh my God! He is the third part of this story, and and he's the angel that ma that somebody said before t today. That he's an angel, no question about it. So he puts the frame around this yeah. extraordinary piece that deals with the loss of work, and the loss of a family member, and certain taboos of mental health. That inner struggle. Yes. Did that? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. He serves as a catalyst for so much of what. I'm so glad you brought that up. One of the takeaways for me in the film the role of music because mm -hmm. when when you look we don't know what what's in Gabe's case that you're that you're bringing down from the closet we don't know what's in there and a lot of things I, I thought it was a scrapbook I thought it was photos it's a musical piece the use of classical music in the in the film as well can you talk to us about was was that part of your story when you were putting this together was that something that you and your composer agreed on because I think it plays a really a really nice role in the film as well I have to credit these two people to my right for almost all of those musical ideas. The, the script, Kidding me? No, no, absolutely. And this, when you have talented and yeah. smart actors that come on board, it's, you, you, you get lucky, certainly as a first-time director, because both Talia and Peter had uh, shared ideas that both contributed to that, that storyline involving yeah, music. It was, it was collaborative, but you let us say, oh... How do we give a voice to our lost child? Yeah. It's a melodic voice, but you did it. So that was... No, that was really uh, in the piece. And that's also another thing that piece. was in the piece of just, was just the things that you find lying around in your life. Mm -hmm. yeah. And in, the, in Gabe's bedroom, for instance, yep. there was a series of musical instruments. And uh, uh, I didn't gravitate toward the clarinet because I've never touched a clarinet. But I have touched uh, uh, a ukulele and a, and a little guitar or something yep. like that. So, you know, it was like found objects. I was able to pick something up, sit on the bed, and play something that was meaningful and evocative to me. Whether it winds up being meaningful and evocative to anyone else, Bob let me do that, yes. you know, and, and get away with it. So pivotal, and and Talia, you talk, your character talks about how you, you, she was she was dead in a sense, and what she most missed was music and dancing together. Yes, and that she can't be dead anymore because that is she does a disservice to the to her son's soul. She has to make a decision to live. That's what she has to stay, and it's very clear. And she says that to her husband. So it's a very clear moment. Because all the, in all the years between them of that loss, so much was unsaid. Yep. You know, and, but with the factory closed down, a certain kind of routine closed down. So right. now we can speak to each other. And it's so relatable for entire generations. Um, it, it may be changing a bit, but it's such, such relational pieces that, are, that, that, you're, that you're offering up in the film. Thank you. One last piece, the, the finding that other core of characters, that a leader who never knew he was one, who he, he becomes this, and, and there's a couple of points in the film, too, where he's deferred to. Well, Allery needs to speak on this. Right. Talk about developing that. Uh, you know, that's... That's a part of the story that um, I didn't think a lot about as I was writing, but I, Talia latched onto that immediately. Okay. One of the first times we met, and we, we all got to sit together yep. over dinner, I think it was maybe the first time in Chicago where we shot, and uh, Talia brought up that, that very notion. Um, and I, I think it's, it's pretty critical to the rest mm -hmm. of the story. Uh, but. I, ha I hadn't really, you know, sometimes you just, you... It was in the piece, Robert. It, it was, was clearly in the piece. Yeah. Subconscious, right? Yep. Yep. And I think for Allery it was. Peter? Yeah, absolutely. You know, I like to liken this. To, I spent a lot of my early years uh, doing stage work, and I did a lot of, uh, in that time, I did a lot of um, um, Shakespeare, and I did a lot of Beckett. And it, this feels like a Beckett piece to me. It feels like waiting for Godot. It feels like Endgame. It feels like where where is this going? We don't know where it's going. Uh, let's go, Vladimir says in Endgame, in 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 Waiting for Godot. And Estragon says, 
will go and they don't move and nothing happens. I have this suitcase. Oh yeah, something, right? like right, something like that. You're, like you're right. And and the you're point right. is that they've they've they they intellectually they don't know how to move. So it has to come from the heart, it has to come from the gut, it has to come from the emotions. And when she says to me, I can't live this way anymore. I've got to live, she says. I'm not going to live this way anymore. I'm going to live. That gives me a choice and it's totally an emotional choice. This is not yep. money, this is not property, this isn't a, am I going to lose this woman? Yep. I can't, I, I can't. I also think, you know, it's also addressing something that maybe gets ignored a lot in cinema or, or art in general is that a person can experience personal growth regardless of age, regardless of where you are in life. Yep. Um, are I'm you a, calling me old? Calling myself old, I think. I, I, I'm pretty old for a first-time filmmaker. Um, and uh, wow, did you hear that? I, I just uh, I feel like these two have been um, inspirations to me. Th that uh, your your career isn't defined by the calendar. And it, and it's it leaves on such a hopeful note in that regard. Yeah, I hope so. Even down to that awesome last track. That last track. Did you have a hand in selecting that one too? That's in the that's in the cantina. Where they? No, Peter. Peter was the choreographer. Yes, he did. He would Peter. say, "Turn now, break." <laughs> yeah. He yep. was the one, and I died with other things to make it work. You held me up. I held I, him yeah, up. Yeah, that but that's up, okay. Yeah. yeah, but he was the he was the he was the choreographer. Yeah, no, he was great choreographer. What I'm gaining from this is that there was such a sense of collaboration with you three on the project. And, and affection and, yeah. and love. I couldn't wait to get to work. I mean, it was wonderful, you know. Wow. Yeah. Robert Jury, Peter Garrity, Talia Shire, Working Man. It's our opening night film. This was such a wonderful conversation. Thank you so much for all your time that you spent with us prior to going in. We're kicking off the film fest in possibly the best way we could. Stay with us. We'll be back with more coverage.